himself kind of um, looking ahead to the future of media. He was working with Al Gore's current TV, which before YouTube was all about bottom-up video. He also worked at Twitter. And then in about tw 2012, made the shift to books. And mo most of you might actually be more familiar with him as the author of the best-selling book, uh, Mr. Penundro's 24-hour book uh, store, and uh, which it sounds like you got some fans here. So one thing just to start off is why the shift? Uh, and he's coming out with another book, and so now he's ensconced in the book world. I just want to say that's the frame here. He, he knows one world, he knows the other, and now we're going to talk about the differences. Why the shift? Um, Can you hear me okay? No, it's no. picking up. Bye. Check. Test, test. There we go. There we go. I think we got it. Um, why the shift? I, I think if you look at a lot of these stories, the answer is that it was there all along, right? And that was the case for me. I mean, even though I was so deeply in the, in the internet world for so long, for my whole career, such as it was, and, um, and you know, from the time I had been a kid onward, I was also a library kid. I mean, I was going to the public library all the time and scouring those, do you remember the, the spinning mesh racks at the library? I feel like that was, my, that was my home turf. I would like spin those racks and pick up the fantasy paperbacks or the choose your own adventures. So that was there from the very beginning, but you know, the internet was exciting, and it still is very exciting. But it was, it kinda, I guess, sucked up a lot of that creative and economic air, and it wasn't until later that I sort of paused to look around that I remembered that that was something I'd always been deeply interested in. Well, so just in a, in a in some way, kind of, what were the things about, or a couple things about the internet world that, that, that left you lacking, and then what are the things that attracted you to get, to get back in the book world? Sure, sure, sure. I mean, I, I, would, I, I would actually flip it around, okay. because I think a lot of the, it was a lot of the attractions of the internet that teed me up to return to old school publishing. Uh, I, I kind of came up in the blogging world, you know, when blogs were new and cool, 2004 to maybe 2008 or 2009, and as someone who had never worked in the traditional publishing world, or never worked at a newspaper or magazine or anything like that, um, it seemed totally natural that, of course, you would be able to write something into a box on your laptop screen, press a button, and have it available everywhere online, you know, instantly. I was like, of course, how, how else would the transmission of ideas possibly take place? So I got used to that, and that actually led me, before it led me to printed books, it led me to the Kindle. Um, when the Kindle first came out, we've, we've talked that we, we appreciate our Kindles and appreciate reading books digitally, and when the Kindle first came out, uh, I thought it seemed like a pretty magical device, and I remember reading my first Kindle book and seeing the way things looked on that screen, that kind of funny, you know, passive, reflective screen. Um, and I, I read that you could put your own stuff up for sale in the Kindle store, and I thought, I think I would like to do that. I think I would like to have some words available for people on this screen. And that was actually the first, you know, talk about kind of returning to those roots. That was where the first words of fiction, that, that Kindle experiment, were the first words of fiction I had written in probably a decade. And actually, it, I ended up writing a short story that was released first as a Kindle single, and the title of that short story was Mr. Penumbra's 24-Hour Bookstore. So, Awesome. But now, as you've been in this world, you were talking about this before, you found the world of books, the slower pace, things like that, oh, yeah. very satisfying. Talk about, about what you really love about that side of things now. Well, I, the, I mean, the truth is that I have, um, I don't know if this metaphor will make sense for everyone, but the way I've thought about it is very metabolic. Um, and because, of course, we, we know all these things about our digestive systems now and the way energy works. And um, the internet, I mean, it's very powerful, but it is like quick burn, it's all sugar. We, and we, we kinda, we've heard this from folks talking about the state of internet journalism today. It's like, and I, so I worked at Twitter, and this, I don't know if this is a widely known fact at this point, but um, just for all you tweeters out there, uh, the average tweet gets nine, finds, reaches 95% of the, the entire audience that it ever will in its life in the first four minutes that it's posted, which is actually powerful in a way. It's like, wow, what a way you could really get it out there to people. But it's also pretty depressing because it is. It's like sugar. It's just dissolved and it's gone. And so, and so really the revelation for me, it, this won't be a revelation to people who, who have known this world for longer, is that books are more like um, 
you know, dense leafy greens or, or protein. The, <laughs> the burn is slower. They, and, and I mean, the fact of the matter is, to put it in very simple terms, I've written plenty of things for the internet, you know, three years ago and longer, and people are not reading those. They're reading whatever was published today on the internet. I wrote a book that was first published three years ago, and plenty of people are still discovering it for the first time today. And for me, that's powerful and remarkable. So just to be fair though, in that book world, coming from the tech world or the, the internet world, what do you see is like, still scratching your head, is like, how can this be that it takes, you know, a year to publish this thing or <laughs> things like that? I mean, anything that you kind of... Yeah, oh sure, sure. I mean, yeah, the, the experience of pressing a button on your screen and having it available to everyone is still powerful and tantalizing. And when I talk to my publisher about, you know, timelines for books, I go, oh, hmm, okay, I'll just, you know, mark my calendar. You have to, you have to like page to the next year in your calendar, which is not something that I, I really do very often. <laughs> but, I've, but I guess, again, it's like the realization is that it's not just, you know, it's certainly not slowness for slowness sake. It's also not just to be slow because like, oh, we have to chop down all the trees and mill them into pulp. Mm -hmm. It's not that either. Instead, there's actually deliberateness to it. Well, what I've learned is that there's a real um, a supply chain, and not, not only or even primarily a physical supply chain, but an intellectual supply chain. I think this, this actually connects to, to the previous conversation about kind of high culture and, mm -hmm. and the way that stuff plays out. Books have um, an intellectual supply chain, and one of the reasons you wait and one of the reasons you're deliberate is you want to make sure that your book gets in front of the right people, is discussed in the right places, that booksellers have a chance to read it and get excited about it so they can recommend it to their you know, clientele, and all that stuff's really important, and it does take time. And it sets you up in a much better way than the publish button. You've also mentioned to me a critique of the internet about how there's actually separate internets and then yeah. how the book world actually has a way of dealing with translation better. Talk yeah. a little bit about that. I mean, again, it's, it's just, it's so interesting to, to have, um, and, I st and just to be clear, I mean, I'm still excited and, and ecstatic about the potential of the internet and all the things that it allows, but uh, of course, one of the lines about the internet is that it's like, well, it actually, it's everything I just said. You can press publish and it's available to the whole world all at once. And of course, that's not true. It's available to all the people that speak your language, probably just in your country, maybe even just in your time zone who are paying attention at that time. And for me, um, the surprise, the great surprise of the first translation of this novel, again, flowing through that intellectual supply chain and realizing that people, other publishers and translators were taking the time to make it comprehensible and intelligible to people in Germany and Russia and you know South Korea and all these other places and to get those copies of the book eventually in the mail after a couple years to get them in the mail and realize that through this old fashioned slow system I was reaching people that I would never have been able to reach and still aren't you know, still can't reach on the internet. So one of the things we've seen here the, over the last few days and I've been involved in several of these conversations yeah. is, is the disruptive potential of of technology, the new economy, new media in that respect, and, and a lot of these kind of negative repercussions. And given that you appreciate both, um, do you have some thoughts about w where the future of this media is, might, where, where t the both could borrow from the others, where we could actually see maybe some kind of syn synthesis between yeah. these, where they're going or something? Absolutely, like absolutely. I mean, I think it has to do, so the answer is yes. I mean, this like we, we can harness this for good, and and we can we can use these tools, these really powerful digital tools, to support the values that we care about and the things we want to do in the world. And it, it can be more than just this like storm that like whoo, sweeps the sweeps the landscape clear. I think it takes two things. Um, one is I think it takes real expertise, and it takes being excited about the tools, like the people who are only suspicious of the internet. You know, sort of that curmudgeonly stance, which we've heard a little of on this stage at different times, that purely curmudgeonly stance is limited because you're never gonna be able to put the tools to use. They're always gonna be sort of the enemy or the, at best, the strange intruder in your you know, otherwise warm, wonderful world. So you have to actually like this stuff, which I think is step one. But then step two is uh, you have to resist, perhaps, the reigning economic systems that are kind of getting played out through this stuff, the idea that everything on the internet has to be enormous, and like if, well, nice website, Pete, but it wasn't Facebook, so what a waste of time. Yeah. Um, and this is like, this is, this is, face that one. <laughs> this yeah. is the conversation, you, you know this, this is the conversation, and it's so, that's so destructive. Um, I have a lot of respect, in fact, the most respect for people who are deploying these tools to make things that are small and niche and focused on, you know, uh, a 
constrained group of thoughtful readers or watchers or users or whatever. I think there's a way forward for that. By the way, folks, if you have questions, do kind of write them up here and we can slip them up here. You, you've got your shot here at uh, probing Robin's brain here. Um, there's been a lot of, I mean, you've been kind of keeping an eye, obviously, on where the internet's going. I mean, there's been a lot of interesting phenoms that are happening, for example, medium. You go from yeah. the, you know, the folks from Twitter are now thinking long form. Yeah. And, and how that start maybe can evolve towards the book yeah. methodical, long form kind of thoughtful mm -hmm. pieces. We're also seeing things like these upstart, you know, big companies getting a lot of this money, like Vox mm -hmm. Media, that are also trying to be actually be much more thoughtful and, and, yeah. um, and bring that more intellectualized, nourishing, kind of uh, mm -hmm. protein-rich kind mm -hmm. of world of the, of the high culture and, yep. and kind of the book world into the internet. I mean, talk about anything, you see any other kind of promising through lines here that make you more optimistic that we could actually see some um, positive evolution here on both sides? Yeah, well, so I am super optimistic, although to be honest, it, it's not those things that make, that make me optimistic. And it's, and it's only because, I mean, I know people who work on all those projects uh, and, I th and I think that they're, they're doing it thoughtfully and methodically. If you want to see, just as an aside, if you want to see the best typography on the internet, go to Medium. The way that they've thought through the M dashes and the like particular everything, like the stuff that you don't even, unless you're a deep, deep typography nerd that you've never even thought about, they have. And it's beautiful. And so that's, that is. And I think that, you know, that sounds maybe a little silly, but I d actually do think that that contributes to some of that a more nourishing, thoughtful stuff. The problem is this, medium has to be big. And all this stuff, Vox, has to be big. Like the own, just because of the way they built these companies and taken in money, and, and I think because of their own ambitions in the world, you know, their, their peers, the people they know, the only way they can succeed and, and sustain themselves, the only way they can keep going is if they're huge. And I don't think it has to be that way. And I, I actually think that one of the sort of counter examples we can use it's gonna found, sound funny because this is not considered like the exciting growth industry, but certain book publishers, not all of them, because some, some book publishers are quite big at this point too, but there are still some book publishers out there that are, they've got their audience. It turns out it actually does not cost that much money to make books and distribute books. And they're, they're like, if they're still operating at cottage industry scale and they're doing a good job and they're sustainable and they have a staff of maybe six people or five people, and the things they're doing are actually, you know, it's, it's not, are they reaching a million people every day? Definitely not. Will their books still be available in libraries and on people's shelves in 30 years? They probably will. And so in that way, I actually think they kind of like have a leg up on the mediums and the boxes in the long run. And I, so, so I'm optimistic that, that those places exist. Some of them are quite good at the internet. They, they have learned the tricks of Facebook and Twitter and e-commerce and all that stuff. And, uh, and I, I, I kind of put my poker chip on those, on those entities. Interesting. You're not tangentially kind of, or you, you're deep in the kind of world of uh, books, which mm -hmm. is a high culture kind of book there. Yep. But you've also kind of seen and, and appreciated the devastation of, say, traditional journalism. Yeah, for sure. And we saw that actually come up in, the, in one of the previous conversations here. Um, how confident are you of a kind of a reboot of a kind of a, a broader media landscape and how far that, that actually is sustaining the kind of more comprehensive coverage of the community, yeah, yeah. the more kind of intellectual kind of niches, uh, the spreading the kind of wealth of kind of media yeah. through that. Uh, well, how, how think about the broader kind of journalism and kind of media infrastructure. Any thoughts well, on that? Well, I mean, that's a, that's, that is so the the big question. Um, we've seen this incredible hollowing out of um, just, the, the real decimation has been local papers and regional papers and local reporting. And I actually, I don't think, I mean, this is sort of the prognosticator's hat, so it's basically all bullshit. But um, I you don't- You were a futurist. Though. I was, I was <laughs> briefly, <laughs> briefly, I was a professional futurist. My business card, best business card I ever had, it said, online futurist, <laughs> Sloan. For uh, current TV. Here it is, for current TV. Uh, I, I actually don't, to tell you the truth, I don't think the answer is gonna be a Berkeley side in every town. Um, I think it's gonna be more Berkeley side in places like that. But I really think we gotta get better at this citizen thing. I think, you know, it's w the, the system to make that work doesn't exist now. It's not like next door. Um, it's not Twitter. It's not Facebook. Maybe it's gonna end up, end up being a combination of all those things. 
But the truth is, we all live in these communities and we see things and we have ideas and we know things too. We like have deep expertise about what's happening in our backyard, you know? Uh, the, the asparagus is coming up. Um, uh, I would like to, date, Dateline, South Berkeley. <laughs> Big crop of potatoes. Mm. Uh, or yeah. how many hummingbirds? We saw hummingbirds. Yeah, I mean, I would honestly, I'm, I'm ready for the hummingbird newswire. All, it would just be all stills and slow-mo iPhone video of hummingbirds. That could kill. Berkeley, Berkeleyside.com slash hummingbirds. <laughs> annihilate. Um, so, so I do think, I think the future has got to be stuff like that, which is in some ways, in some ways is a hard thing to say because that, we don't know what that model is. It, we can't just say, make me more of that. It doesn't, it doesn't exist yet. But I think, I think that's the only way it's going to work. I'm going to shift topics quickly here, and again, if anyone has a question, do bring it up here. But speaking of local, your mm -hmm. next book is rooted on the East Bay, that's and right. I think it has a theme of food in it or something. Yeah, that's right. Do you want to talk a little yeah, bit about I'll it? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about it, sure. What, what can um, we expect? Uh, so the first one, for, for folks who haven't read it, um, it's a story that unfolds in San Francisco proper, mostly in a mysterious 24-hour bookstore um, that's sort of nominally in, in North Beach. It's kind of a city lights analog, except way smaller and actually much weirder, um, <laughs> which, is, which is very weird indeed. Um, so it's, a, it's very much a San Francisco story, and then it kind of kind of reaches down into Silicon Valley as well, and that's kind of the axis that the story plays out on. This one, because uh, I, and I lived in San Francisco at that time, so that was just, it was very drawn from what I was thinking about every day and the streets I was walking on. This new one, I'm a Berkeley resident now and have been for some time, um, it, a lot of it plays out here in the East Bay. Some some locations that you um, that you might uh, that you might recognize. There's a place. This this might be revealing too much, but I will tell you that um, you know when you're making notes for novels and things like that, you before you really come up with the names for things, you often have little placeholders. And so if you looked at my notes, you would often you see something like da 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 goes again to DCP, and DCP stood for Dark Shea Panisse, and it's my <laughs> sort of like imagine just imagine it took Shea Panisse, but like made it kind of creepy <laughs> and haunted and dark. It has a different, it's not called, it's not called DCP, but, <laughs> but it's in the book. And it, and it does, it, uh, it, the, the, you know, if, if the first novel, um, besides just being about characters and a mystery and, you know, an adventure and all that, it was very much about the world of books and, you know, where books came from and where they're going. Uh, this new one is very much about the world of food. It kind of wends its way through old and new ideas about how we should eat. Um, it'll be out sometime next year. I'm not sure when exactly. This is the publishing issue we're talking about. You yeah, never yeah, know. Yeah, in 24 to 36 months. <laughs> 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 Worth the wait. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, well, I tell you, so, um, and so you feel, do you feel as, you're kind of bringing that to, to, to bed, right? That book? Yeah, yeah, finishing it now. Mm -hmm. So are you thinking of yourself now, when, when I talked to you about the two different worlds, and I said, well, which do you prefer, yeah. and which do you think you'll be in, you said what? What would you say to that one? Um, well, I, I would, I mean, you would have to really twist my arm um, and tie me down to make me choose. Because only because I, I really, not, not only just to be kind of like, oh, I, I want it all. But, um, but because I, I really resist um, the, the dichotomies. So many of these conversations get stuck because people want to make it an or or a versus when instead, of course, the right answer is and. There's mm -hmm. exciting things to do and exciting ways to reach people on the shelf in an indie bookstore and you know, in a newsreader online or in the app store. You know, I've made, I have an app. I have an app that people can read that I published in the, in the app store for the iPhone. And, it's not quite as, I will, I will admit that the, um, the rewards have not been quite as satisfying as the novel that I published, but it's pretty cool. And I would like to do more things like that and keep a foot in that world. I, would, I guess I'll put it this way. I'd feel like I was really surrendering something if I had to give up on the digital stuff. I think there's more to, more to discover there. Well, actually, okay, so here's a question. Um, kind of in this, because again, to what extent are you representative of someone in this book space? I mean, you've actually had a phenomenal success with that first novel and, yeah. and looking like they'll be continue to be uh, working that. But it says here, in an era when everyone is blogging, do you have any suggestions on how to distinguish your work oh, yeah. as a novice blogger yeah. and to reach an audience past your kind of personal network? And right. so here's someone who wants, and probably let's say also wants to do serious work and serious writing and, and get a real Yeah, yeah, comment. yeah. Boy, that's, I mean, that's, whoever asked that question, it's the right question because it's hard. And it's harder now than it was before. It, there was a moment in blogging when 
it was a little more fertile for, for kind of new voices. And now it just, the internet has changed. And, and it's Facebook and Twitter and things like that, that that have changed it. However, the answer is still the same. It's always the same. And it's true for publishing just as much as it's true for blogging. You got to find your people. Like, there could be no other answer. Um, and it's going to start with your friends. But there are people, I mean, I guarantee if you're someone who's interested in writing and sharing things, you have people you follow online and people who you read, who you admire. And the first step is when you feel like you've kind of got your act together and it looks cool and you have something smart to share is you send it to them. Like, that's the first step. And you try to make, you try to build that web. Because every, like, every good thing, even things in crazy pop culture that seem like they came out of nowhere, there, I mean, people who, who have worked in media and see these things emerge, they know this. It all comes out of this web, this web of alliances and people having each other's back and being excited about each other's work. And the people who are really successful, they're like spiders in the center of this very dense, kind of vibrating web. So when you're starting out, you're like, you're just you. <laughs> you have like one strand. Mm -hmm. And you can just kind of start building it. There's no other way. There's another interesting question. Um, it builds on what we said before a little bit here. But um, you almost draw a line between print and internet. Now, they might have written this before you just distinguish that. But do you think there's a way to produce internet content that will have a long shelf life and readability over time? Oh I man, that's I am so, I'm so, I'm fascinated. I mean, I could, I could think and argue and wonder for hours endlessly about that question. I think it's one of the main questions of our time. I would say that the things on the internet now do not reach that, do not reach that standard. I, there's no reason to expect that anything published on the internet today in 2015 will be accessible or viewable in even 10 years, to say nothing of 30 years or 50 years. Um, whereas even, I mean, that's, and that's, that's actually. You're saying something. that from a technical point of view? Yeah. Or, or from a just I know, a, absolutely, a thoughtful point no, of no, view? No, 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 absolutely technical. I think that like the way that things kind of rot on the internet, everything, everything always looks great. When it's on the website and it's all, everything's like working, it looks great. You're like, oh, it's fantastic. It's just like reading an amazing magazine. But there's actually there's so many brittle dependencies behind, as someone who has worked on a lot of websites, I can tell you, there's so many brittle dependencies behind all those things, and all it takes is for one company to buy another company, for someone to go out of business, for a website to decide it's gonna change its strategy, and someone decides, well, ah, we, we won't, my, forget all the old stuff, you know, just, it's fine, we'll just go forward. And then suddenly a bunch of links break, and it all kind of, kind of comes tumbling down like a house of cards. There are some um, sort of, band, it's bigger than a band-aid, it's more like one of those trauma bandages <laughs> over that problem. <laughs> and like the, in, the Internet Archive, for instance, there's this wonderful institution in San Francisco, I'm sure lots of people here know it, the Internet Archive, they're trying to just make copies of everything. More power to them, but even they have problems with things still disappearing and things breaking. So I think, I mean, I guess, I guess my answer to that question is to spin it forward. The generation of people uh, coming up now and, and, and working now, um, designing things, publishing things on the Internet, I think it's, there's actually some moral urgency to that question. How can we make sure that it, it actually has some durability? Because right now it doesn't. It's a perfect place to end. It's a perfect timing. And we have a lot more to go here. But thank great. you so much for sharing. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Okay.